Welcome to one more uh, segment of Politics Done Right. Today I'm honored to be with Domingo Garcia, who is LULAC's national president. Domingo, welcome to Politics Done Right. How are you doing? Thank you for having me on the show. I'm doing great. Well, look, let me tell you, Domingo, um, when I got the opportunity to speak to you, um, it, it, I wish it were on better terms, but one of the subjects that I really wanted to talk about was what's happening to our people in the meatpacking industry. And, you know, we could extrapolate that to a lot of other places. So um, before we get started, tell me a little bit about yourself and what you're doing with LULAC. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm, the, I'm the son of a... Uh, undocumented immigrant who came to the United States when he was 15 and a Native American mother, Apache, Native American in West Texas who met. Uh, I was, you know, uh, my mom was 17. I was a teenage mom. I'm um, the oldest of seven. I uh, grew up on the farm worker fields of West Texas, uh, but the first one to graduate from high school went on to uh, grad, get work my way through school at the University of uh, Texas, North Texas. And then I went to Houston uh, to Texas Southern University, graduated from Thurgood Marshall School of Law. Uh, and uh, been a Latino activist most of my life because when you start from the bottom, you don't forget uh, uh, who's still there and how you need to help. And that's why I became national president of LULAC now for about two and a half years and been active. And as I was a former city council member, the first Latino mayor pro tem of Dallas, uh, was a state representative for, for six years uh, and uh, passed House Bill 1403, uh, which was a Texas Dream Act, which allowed uh, uh, what we now have dreamers uh, in uh April 6, 2006, led uh, 500,000 people through downtown Dallas on the pro-immigration march, one of the largest marches in American history. Um, so, you know, I'm down for the cause, basically. Let me, let me uh, tell you I why, I, why I wanted to ask you this, and I, there's another question I want to ask you before we get into the meat of what we want to discuss, is we have a lot of organizations that claim to be working for the people, for the man, for the, the masses. And what I love with your story is that what we have is somebody who's lived it, somebody who's worked through it, and somebody who is coming back to mitigate what's going on right now. You told me a story that was really touching earlier on as we spoke uh, about a woman who was taking care of her grandkids and had an interesting uh, interaction with the criminal justice system. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that? My first job uh, out of law school was uh, working at the Harris County District Attorney's Office there in Houston, Texas. And uh, we had a, I was working misdemeanor courts and we had a 83 year old African-American woman, elderly, uh, looked at her, her file, no private criminal record. And when I spoke to her, cause she didn't have an attorney. And she told me that her uh, daughter who had evidently was addicted to drugs had left two of her grandchildren with her. And she only had a social security check and they were crying. And she basically uh, shoplifted uh, baby milk and, and uh, pampers and got caught. Um, so I wanted to dismiss the charges and just send her to social services. The DA at that time, my chief said, no, you know, she has to have a, a fine and she has to pay. And I just was felt that that was injustice. So I dismissed the charges against her and I resigned from the DA's office that day. I just, that wasn't what I thought justice was about. And, you know, that left an indelible impression on me. I mean, we, that is a kind of uh, person in the so in the in the criminal justice system that we need, and I mean it, it all. Your life plays a good part, or rather, a necessary part in what's going on now. Tell me a little bit about what's happening specifically in the meatpacking industry that sort of uh, that we should be aware of, and that we should be fighting to make sure uh, things are quite a bit different than they are right now. Well, when an American family goes tonight and have dinner, they pray, you know, before. Uh, the meal, thank Jesus for this. It's really Jesus. There's a Jesus somewhere at a meatpacking plant in Marshalltown, Iowa, in O'Neill, Nebraska, in Cactus, Texas, okay, who's actually uh, there and doing some of the hardest work. For those of you who might have read uh, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair about the conditions at the meatpacking plants in Chicago in the early 1900s, they haven't changed that much, okay? It's still a, a backbreaking job that almost no Americans done. And in fact, probably 80% of the workforce are undocumented or refugees, meaning from Africa, who work at these plants. Uh, long hours, very difficult work for minimum wage. And what's happened is that with the COVID-19, once one person gets it, these are people that are two, 3,000 people in a plant, bumper to bumper, basically. Uh, and the meatpacking companies, billion dollar companies, the largest one is JBS, owned by two Brazilian billionaires. 
billionaires of B. And another one, like Smithfield, owned by Chinese companies, their just concern was the bottom line of the dollar. And these disposable workers, okay, are now essential workers because if you are not going to get that steak, that pork chop, that chicken leg, unless their plants are going. And these plants have been closing as literally dozens of workers have died in the last two weeks. Thousands, we're estimating 5,000. I, I want to interrupt for a second here. Um, we don't hear that dozens of workers have died from the coronavirus. Please, are you telling me it's not the three or four that the mainstream media is reporting right now? You're saying dozens of meat workers or have actually died? Yes, I'm, I'm going to make them personal. Uh, in Greenlee, uh, uh, Colorado, uh, which is a JPS plant, uh, we received a complaint three weeks ago. And we started trying to work with the owners of the plant about the conditions of the workers. Give them PPE uh, masks. Uh, give them a class and separate them. Slow down the production lines so that uh, we can stop the virus. They refused to do so. We had to go and send a letter to the governor of Colorado, had to file complaints with OSHA, had to file complaints with the local health department. And they closed them down. But you know what happened between then? It, 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 Four people died. Among them was a gentleman named Zola Sanchez, 78 years old, worked at the plant for 36 years, and wow. went and got sick and died and left a wife and children, okay? And he's just one of many, okay? Uh, here in Dallas, Texas, where I'm at today, two people at a sausage-making factory died this week, okay? And over uh, several dozen are sick. And this is happening across the country. Uh, we are putting a database because there's not one right now. We're working with the union. Some of these places are unionized. Uh, but no, we're talking about literally life and death decisions being made to go to work. And this week, in one of the most, I think, tragic decisions ever made by a president of the United States, Donald Trump used the War Powers Act okay, to say that we are going to make sure these meat packing plants are open. And no matter what the governor or the local health department says, these plants are going to stay open. And if somebody dies, one of the workers dies, one of the workers is hospitalized in a ventilator, the companies are immune. Okay? That means that when Saul Sanchez dies in Greenland, Colorado, his wife and children cannot sue the company. They put him in a dangerous situation. And that's just total abuse of power. It's immoral. It's unchristian and it's un-American. It is completely un-American. Uh, uh, when, I, when I saw that uh, Mitch McConnell wants to extend that law even further to cover all companies that are bringing people in to absolve them of any responsibility, of their n negligent in their places of business that get their, their uh, employees infected. And then they want to open the states, quote-unquote, open the states and have people working. So, I mean, this extends further than the meat plants, even though the meat plants are where we are having some concentration right now. Isn't it true that because first responders are generally manual work, except for doctors and nurses, of course, uh, the janitors, the, the people who have to clean up at hospitals, the people who have to serve, the people who have to deliver packages from the people who are staying home away from the virus. Isn't it true that based on our socioeconomic system right now, it tends to be a majority of black and brown people and uh, very poor socioeconomically absolved uh, uh, white people? What COVID-19 has done is shown the economic apartheid in America between the haves and the have-nots. It's shown the, the health apartheid in America between the haves and the have-nots. And the fact of the matter is black and brown people, for example, are disproportionately being impacted. They're on the front lines. They're essential workers, even though they were considered disposable workers, dis disponibles in the Spanish in the past. You know, a worker got injured. He was taken off and another immigrant was put in there. Uh, well, now they're considered essential workers. But they're not treated as such workers. And the fact of the matter is, these people that are in the meatpacking companies, plants, at the poultry plants, at the pork plants, they're just as essential and as important as that doctor and nurse at a hospital. But they're not treated that way. They are heroes. They're making sure that those steaks and pork chops wind up on America's table. All they're asking for is safe working conditions. And, for example, if a worker gets hurt or if he gets sick with COVID-19 and is out two weeks, he gets no check. There is no sick leave. And they can't complain because many of them are undocumented. Okay? So the people that Trump rails against, the immigrants, the brown and black people coming into the United States, are the ones that are keeping America fed. 
They're the economic engine of America, and they always have been, but they've never been respected or treated with dignity. It's amazing that prejudice, the consequences of prejudice, if we actually plant it out to, to where they want it to be, how they would stay unfed, how they would be, how the, the kind of problems that they would have. Now, I, I, whenever I have these types of interviews, I like to uh, ask what are the immediate solutions and then what are the long-term solutions? So what do you see as an immediate solution to this? I know you're having a town hall uh, on Monday, I believe. Uh, before we go into solutions, why don't you tell us a little bit about this town hall that you're going to be having? Uh, on Monday at 2 o'clock, we will be having uh, LULAC along with uh, five congressmen, including Joaquin Castro from San Antonio and Fremo Vela from the Valley, and uh, two uh, senior uh, committee chairs over the health and working conditions of these uh, uh, meat packers uh, uh, and the fights that they're in. Uh, they are not having congressional hearings because the Congress is still not in session. So this is the closest thing we can do. I heard today that Biden might uh, join in uh, on the town hall. Uh, we had one this last week uh, on Thursday with Univision. Uh, we had 1.3 million people uh, listen in. We're expecting a larger crowd this Monday. Uh, because this is important, and this is impacting people. And even though you might not hear about it, well, there might be a meat shortage. But there might be a meat shortage because all these workers are getting sick and dying, and these plants are closing. And we got to make sure we do this right. So immediately improve the work conditions of these, of these workers, provide them benefits, sick leave, unemployment, provide for their medical care, uh, make sure they're legal residents. They say, I'm afraid to go get a test or go to the hospital because I could become a public charge and lose my green card and be deported back to the country of origin. President Trump and this administration has the authority to give them temporary protective status, all of them, to make sure that they get tested, they get treated, and they go back to work and keep the, the, the food supply going uh, in a safe manner. But you're refusing to do that. And I think that's where the answer is. And we're asking Congress to help us with that. Now, I want to ask you about the campos and the fincas right now, the, the, the fields and the farms, okay? Because there we have an overrepresentation as well of, uh, of um, black and brown folks, mostly brown folk at, in, in the fields. Tell me, uh, right now we're seeing a whole lot of waste because there is nobody to really uh, take the food. I think we still have the people who will pick the food to take the food. How do you see going forward um, in America uh, that when it's time to start the cycle all over again? Well, almost uh, 90% of all the farm workers, the people who put those vegetables on your table uh, are Latino. Uh, mm -hmm. And some are Filipino, but mainly Latino. Uh, and uh, I got a complaint yesterday uh, from our, one of our LULAC councils in Arizona uh, by Tucson that said that uh, all these farm workers are being laid off because restaurants are, the, the vegetables that used to go to restaurants, uh, uh, restaurants have been closed in most of America. Yeah. For 45 days now. Uh, so that's why their farmers are plowing their, the crops down. And this is leaving thousands and thousands of farm workers that are unemployed. And in Arizona, they're waiting uh, four to five hours in line because they got to go in person to fill out the unemployment form. Okay. And then they got to come back once a week to show that they still don't have a job to continue getting the checks. And they're doing, they're standing out there in 100, 105 degree weather. Okay. And we're going to be providing water for them and, and cold drinks just because there's thousands of them lined up around the building to get unemployment. And that's just in that one particular place in Arizona. We're hearing the same thing in California, Washington State, Wisconsin. Um, it's a serious concern because, again, these families living are week to week, month to month, and if they don't have any money coming in, then that means they're going to be evicted, that means they're going to lose their car, the small positions they have, and the inequality that you see in the United States will just get bigger and bigger. And uh, I think that's going to lead to possible social strife in the future. I actually Unless think the government takes immediate, I'm going to call it New Deal uh, proposals like Franklin Roosevelt. It took the Great Depression for Roosevelt to pass Social Security, to pass Medicare, to pass unemployment. Uh, everybody said that was socialism and communism when he did it, but that's what got America up again. And I think we're going to need some bold, courageous uh, political leaders, both Democrats and Republicans, to help people right now. Otherwise, I think. Uh, the class divisions will just be exacerbated, exacerbated. The racial divisions will be exacerbated, and the politics of us against them that Trump has been playing will play again uh, again in November with serious ramifications in the future, which only the Russians can be happy about. 
Well, you know, the funny thing about it is uh, all these plutocrats need to remember they're more of us than they are of them. That's numero uno. But also, I, I think it's important. First of all, you talk about uh, impending depression. Because of, because of the dereliction of duty of Congress and the president, I will tell you something, okay, or the Senate and the president, we are, and you can mark my word on this, we are going into a depression. The problem is how long it's going to last, and, and likewise, how do, do we mitigate it? And my expectation is I hope they understand that the only mitigation is going to be UBI and a lot of these, these different types of, of uh, services and policy that right now it's anathema to most of the Republicans. So uh, you're, you're concerned about a depression. I'm telling you we have to work and understand that we are going into a depression. Uh, I before we go, uh, give me a closer and go ahead. go ahead. I think that Andrew Yang has the correct answer. And for those of you who follow yes. the Democratic primary, yes. uh, a universal income. Uh, instead of giving the money to these multi-billion dollar Fortune 500 companies, like we did in the first round of supposedly small business loans, right. which went to the fake houses in the Marriott of the world, instead of the Taquería de Lupita or Juanas Quisinera shop uh, that needed the help, uh, we need to give everybody $2,000 a month uh, until we get back to the employment figures that we had before the pandemic. And if we don't, then a lot of Americans are going to be left out and uh, it's not going to be good for the United States. We need to have a, a healthy, uh, good middle class or working class. Otherwise, if you just have the 1% and then the 99%, uh, that's just going to lead to potential uh, bad situations in America. Domingo Garcia, LULAC National President. It's been my honor to have you on Politics Done Right. Thank you so kindly for being here. Please don't become a stranger. Have me on again. Thank you. Absolutely. La victoria. Thank you. La victoria, hermano. Adios. Adios. I'm Egberto Willis, host of Politics Done Right, an independent news program. I post several news videos of interest every day. I ask you so kindly to subscribe to my channel and please leave me some comments. Thank you very much.